Okay, so you saw the beautiful graphics and all the great sound at the beginning of this talk. I am going to do as, uh, as worse a possible of job of graphics and sound. Were you at Harry's talk yesterday morning? Yeah? yeah? So he's talking about performance and speed and like really good stuff. Mine's like the opposite end of that. So this is just going to be slow, crap graphics, terrible sound. Um, so you're going to unlearn everything you got from Harry. So the web is an amazing place today. Um, it's, uh, we've seen talks on um, accessibility and, um, uh, well, we've got WASMs on the internet. We've, we've seen machine learnings uh, yesterday, superb stuff. Uh, we've got PWASs. I think there was a talk yesterday about that. Um, performance is a, a, a huge thing that we have to focus on. And um, we get to you know, watch talks and, and read articles. And um, we have uh, a service worker as well. Oh, sorry, this is the official logo for a service worker, which Jake Archibald put together. Um, and um, the Google I.O. conference earlier this year said that the uh, service worker was probably one of the biggest steps forward for the web in a decade. And it opens up things like offline and push notifications, the kind of things that native apps have had. And we can get it in the browser. It's an amazing time to work on the web. We've got Twitter telling us how you know, we can learn more and how we can be uh, more performant and more accessible and more uh, user experience-y. And you've got LinkedIn, if you ever visit that website, with articles and Medium and posts. And oh, fuck, it's so tiring. So tiring. I want to go back to an age where things were simpler, easier, slower, louder. And I want to go back to uh, an, uh, an older age, my age. Um, but before I get into my talk, I've got a couple of content warnings. Um, there is some flashing imagery. So if you see this icon up in the corner, there's going to be some flashing imagery. Um, there is some disorientating sounds. Um, so I've got this icon up in the corner, uh, so much so that when I um, started rehearsing this talk, my seven-year-old son was like, oh god, not this again. Um, and there is some very questionable JavaScript. So you can judge me all you want, but it will make no difference to the quality of the code. So I was a child of the 80s, obviously, uh, dressed as Mr. T here with, uh, with earrings and beard. Um, and I had the privilege of growing up in um, a home in the 80s uh, where we had a computer in the home. Um, and my dad worked in banking. He was into computers. And he would, uh, he would start kind of bringing these computers home. And in England, um, the computing kind of home computing revelation kind of exploded in the early 80s. Uh, in fact, actually 1980. Um, and we had this machine. Um, so I think you had a Spectrum clone in Poland. Hands up who even recognizes what this is. Just OK, so everyone else is a young, healthy age, and you're going to die later, much later. Um, so this is um, this particular machine is a ZX, 80, uh, ZX uh, Spectrum. And there were two machines just before this, so ZX80 and ZX81. They're brought out in 1980 and 1981. The first one was uh, 70 pounds, uh, about 200 euros in today's money. I don't know what that is in losses. Um, but in, for 70 pounds, you could have a computer in your home. Now, bearing in mind this was 1980, the, the, the decade before, computers filled entire rooms. So they went from this kind of like huge computing industry to bring a computer into your home. You could plug this thing into your television, and you could do word processing if that's what you wanted to do. Or you could play games, which is what I wanted to do. Um, and it exploded in the UK. So. <coughs> I spent a lot of time with this machine as a kid. And um, my talk is about this. This relates to JavaScript in some way. But um, this is how you would get your programs into uh, the spectrum. So uh, this is a tape. Uh, for those of younger, it's uh, like a shitty USB stick. Um, <coughs> and it's uh, a magnetic medium which means that it's, it, it can break quite often. So um, uh, you would stick this tape into a cassette player. The cassette player would be wired into the spectrum, which you saw earlier. You'd hit play, and it would like 
play the audio into the machine, and the machine would load all that audio, process it, and load a game for you. And really, this was a major part of doing anything on the spectrum. You had to play this tape into the computer and wait for it to load. Um, and this medium has all kinds of problems with it. Like it, Sometimes it would unspool and give you beautiful pictures of uh, Jimi Hendrix. Most of the time, it would just be a tangled mess and eaten by your cassette player, and you'd be there with your biro, kind of your pencil spinning round and round and round. And also, because it was such a brittle um, uh, medium, it would break, and the spectrums were buggy as well because it was kind of early computing. Um, tape players aren't particularly um, uh, known for giving you a perfect quality of sound, and quite often the games and the programs you were loading just wouldn't work. Now, I had a, a tried and tested technique that would almost guarantee it working. I would sit there with my hands clasped and just go, please load, please load, please load, over and over again, which is not that far different to uh, mobile loading on my phone these days. Um, I canvassed Twitter as well to ask them how they would, if they had any kind of um, rituals to get their games to load. Um, one person said that they would have to turn their, their machine upside down. That would guarantee the load. Um, another person would have to hold their breath. That would make the game load. And another person had all their siblings leave the room. And then when uh, they were out of the room, the game would, would load. So this is what I was dealing with when I was trying to uh, do any kind of computer experience as a child. Um, now, I've been talking about this, but you don't know what it sounds like yet. So um, we've got a content warning up here. Um, I'm going to show you what it looks like when you would load a game. And because, because the loading process would go so horribly wrong so often, I spent most of my childhood just waiting for games to load, not being parented, just listening to this. So. I'm going to play some of this to you. I've got my sound muted, so I've got a bit of control over the sound. Um, and this is a, an emulator. Is that sound? Nope. You're in the right sound? You haven't got any sound. Come on. OK, wait a second. Here's my sound preferences over here. This is my desktop. Output, microphone. Come on. You got it. No. Go on. You can do it. The sound guy's just going to make the noises for me. <laughs> Come on. Shall I pull it out and put it back in again? Here you go. This is, that's also an old uh, technique. <laughs> Come on. Come on. Will it to work? It's not even live demos. It's not my problem. I mean, I can. <laughs> <laughs> I can. What? It's not even coming out of my speakers. That's me holding it. Oh, for fuck's sakes. <sighs> right, what should we do? I'm not going to make up the sounds. You need to hear this. Nope, oh, I got sound. Hang on. OK, just that first command, load, quote, quote, is obviously how you get it to load from the tape. OK, so it's kind of like JavaScript these days. Like, it's just fucking guesswork. Load, quote, quote. So nothing's happened yet. This is just you put a tape in there. That just says there's something coming. OK, so at this time, I'm about six, seven, eight. And um, I want to play this game. It's called Dan Dare. And I have to listen to this and watch this to play the game. And what we're listening to is not even the game. This is just the screen. And it would go wrong quite frequently, just be like, didn't work. So we had a lot of patience in the 80s. That's what. That's the, the, the story from this. So you'd have to wait for all of that to load, and that's just the screen that shows you you put the right tape into the machine. So I thought, wouldn't it be great, great to make all of that on the web? 
So that's what my talk is about. So I wanted to recreate that entire experience. Yep, but I figured I could use browser APIs to do that. So the first thing I need to do is recreate the sound. So there's, there's a few parts to this. The sound is kind of the, one of the most iconic parts, and you know, sparks all this kind of um, uh, nostalgia in me. So I need to create the sound. And I know um, a tiny bit about sound, not much. Um, and I can recognize the different sound waves. And I know that the browser has APIs to make sound. So um, what we've got here is three different uh, types of sound waves. The first one is the pilot tone, which is like a steady sound that you hear at the beginning. I figure that's like relatively easy compared to the rest of the sound. That little middle bit that's highlighted, that's um, the, you hear like a little spike of sound. That's called a sync signal. And that tells the machine that there's some data about to come. And that bottom section is the actual data. Um, and you've got kind of the, it going up and down. It makes a, very, a fairly distinct sound. Um, and that's the tape telling the spectrum to load some data. So I know that we have the uh, web, uh, web audio API. So I can create an audio context, create an oscillator, which is like a sound wave, uh, set the frequency to 830 megahertz, because Twitter told me to do, to do this. Um, and then I basically connect that to the destination, which again, obviously, is your speakers. So it sounds like this. I think it's a bit loud. Let me bring the sound down. It doesn't even sound right, but it's close enough. So I moved on. So I've got the first bit, but that was the easy part. The next part is programmatically making sound, making it sound like the tape is loading. Now, I can, I can take an audio buffer and fill it with random data, um, but that will just give me white noise. And I don't want white noise. I want it to sound like the tape. So I need to generate these waves. Um, and the web being the amazing place that it is, I went off and I, I started reading about sound and how to generate sound and how to generate sound waves and how um, tones worked and frequencies worked. And there's so much content on the web. It's a truly amazing place. Um, and then I fell into the, the, the black hole that is the world of spectrum.org, where people have just taken everything they know about these the machines and just poured it into one website. They reverse engineered how the, the chips worked inside the machine. They uploaded tons of games, um, artwork, and everything, and explained what these sounds represent. So I end up using this and forgetting everything else I learned about audio. So the amplitude of the, uh, the audio wave is irrelevant to uh, the job that I'm doing. What matters is the width of the pulse. So they refer to this as a pulse. The point where it crosses, um, so these are all samples. And the samples go from minus 1 to 1. And that's how we make sound, apparently. Um, and when it goes from minus 1 to positive 1, that's the edge of a pulse. And that's the width of a pulse. This is 855 t-states, which um, uh, a t-state in the spectrum language is the time it takes to perform one operation. So the spectrum uh, runs at 3.5 megahertz, so it does 3.5 million operations per second. So um, 855 t-states, that length of time is, is obviously 0 0.00024 millisecond, uh, seconds. Um, so I need to make a sound that's that long which is really, really short. Now, the pair of waves together make a binary 0, and the pair of long waves make a binary 1. So I now know how to do binary using sound, if I can generate these uh, samples. So you don't have to follow any of this code. And I'm pretty sure no one's going to go back to their corporate websites and be like, you know what, we should make all of it like sound-based. Um, but this is how to do it. We've got a sample rate of 44 megahertz. Uh, we get our t-state length, which is 1 over 3.5 uh, megahertz. And to get the number of samples required for a t-state, we multiply the, the, the length of the, uh, the, the pulse that we want um, by t, the t-state length, multiplied by the sample rate, and we add half, just for good measure. Um, and then we floor the value. So we get a whole number. Um, and what I end up with is the number of samples required for 855 t-states. So the number of samples are 11 samples, 22 samples. And samples are the values like the ones and the zeros that make the wave. So now that I know how many samples I need, I can um, make some audio. So here I've got um, uh, the length of zero. I'm going to create a float array, which is the because I need the uh, up and the down of the wave. Um, so it's twice the length. 
and I'm going to populate it with bits. And I end up with a wave that looks like this. So positive 1 for a whole bunch for 11, uh, negative 1 for 11. And I've got 22 samples make a binary 0. You're following this, right? Good. Um, <coughs> so now, because I can make binary as sound using samples, I can go to the front end uh, con.io con website. I can do a fetch on that website, and I can receive that as um, uh, uh, uint array 8, so I get the, uh, the bytes. And then what I need to do is create a buffer that's big enough to make sound that represents all of those bytes. So I'm going to take the number of bytes, multiply by 8, because there's 8 bits in a byte. I'm going to uh, get uh, the sample length for uh, the number of bytes multiplied by 1, because it's the longest uh, pulse, multiplied by 2, because we have two pulses per, um, uh, per binary uh, bit. And um, I'm going to create a buffer that's that length, which is pretty long. Um, and I'm going to generate all the audio for the, uh, the HTML that I grabbed from um, frontend con.io. And I'm going to connect that to my destination and play it to you. So this is the front end uh, conference website as audio. You ready for this? That's the leading angle bracket. Exclamation mark. D, you see where I'm going with this? O, should I do the whole page or stop? Yeah. OK, cool. We've got sound working. So that is sound version of this uh, conference website. Cool. Or, well, cool to me, maybe not so much to you. OK, so the next part is loading bars. Now, the loading bars are the things we see around the edge of the screen. Um, and it's a brilliant bit of UI. Like, it's um, a br br brilliant bit of UX that tells us something's loading. <coughs> Excuse me. It's a really, I think, really beautiful story uh, where this comes from. Because you'll see these loading bars in uh, all the other machines that kind of popped up in this era. So the Commodore, um, the uh, my brain's gone blank. Well, the Commodore and some other machines. But they all use the same technique, and it comes from this. This is the uh, ZX80, um, and when they would load, uh, audio, uh, load the, the programs, it would disrupt the display. And the reason for this is that the chip that was inside the machine only had eight pins. So they had to kind of reuse the tech as much as possible. So they used one pin to manage all the display, but they used that same one pin to deal with reading audio. So anytime any audio is read, it would disrupt the display. Engineers being engineers are like, that is not a bug. <laughs> that is a feature. I know that the audio is working because it's messing up the display. Um, and in fact, actually, this is like a really early version of like a loading spinner. Like You know it's working. So it's, it's kind of a little bit of a user experience. OK, so I've got these bytes from uh, the front end conference website. And I can't just dump it into a canvas. So I'm going to use a canvas to draw all the bars. But I can't just run it into a canvas, because JavaScript runs really fast. And we don't want fast. We want slow. So what I need to do is take all the bytes, run it through an audio processor so it's in sync with the sound that we hear, and then take all the audio that the JavaScript hears and process that onto a canvas. OK. So there's a few ways that you can process uh, audio in JavaScript. Um, the first one is the analyzer node, which is used for things like um, spectrum graphs, not spectrum graphs, but like spectrum graphs, like you know where you have like a sound wave and you see it. But it, it tends to drop a bit of data. It's like a sampling and maths and stuff. So I was like, that doesn't work. So then we have these two options: script processor node and uh, audio worklet. Now they are actually uh, technically the same. The uh, script processor node was marked as deprecated in August. Uh, 2014, so over four years ago, and superseded with the uh, audio worklet, um, which doesn't work in most browsers. So we're going to use the one that actually works in browsers and ignore the standards and the recommendations. Um, but it, like the audio worklet is better, perf uh, higher performance, better, but it doesn't work in most places. Anyhow, so we use a script processor node, and there's an event that says, I have some samples from the audio, um, and I'm going to uh, give you those samples, and you're going to do something with it. So we have this, um, this read event handler, 
Uh, we get the sample to come in, and what we need to do, or what I need to do, is read all those pulses, so their values between anywhere between positive 1 and minus 1, and I need to uh, find the point of inflection where it goes from negative 1 to positive 1, and say, right, that's the beginning of a pulse, and when it goes down from positive 1 to negative 1, that's the end of that pulse. And uh, I need to read it in pairs, so I need to kind of like keep going, and then basically collect all my bits. So once that works, I just render it to the screen. So I'll come on to the rendering in a second. What I did do is um, I tried it out, and I, I, I did run it without the, um, the processor node, and I happened to have DevTools open at the same time. And um, I ran a performance profile on it, because it's like it's kind of millions of samples being generated and, um, and being played. And um, I was like, this is taking like five or six seconds. I guess a lot of data, a lot of audio. Uh, I'll take a look, and actually, we see that um, it's spending all of its time over here, like three seconds on a whoop, shift. So three seconds on a shift seems pretty expensive. And just because I had DevTools open and that source panel open, it gave me all the performance profi uh, timing. So I changed, I mean, shift is a mutation on an array. But it shouldn't really be so expensive. I mean, it, wasn't, it was going through millions of iterations on this shift. So by doing a small refactor, it completely changes the, pro, uh, the performance profile. It goes down to like 100 milliseconds in this uh, new kind of allocation of an empty array. So just having a look at uh, DevTools and having your performance profile open and the source code uh, open is, is pretty useful. But these are still arrays. And one of the big things I learned about doing this is that if you move to typed arrays, it completely changes the performance profile. So this, is the this code does the same thing, but nothing goes over like 20 milliseconds. Yeah, 20 milliseconds. And it's because I've gone from regular arrays to typed arrays. And I'm not talking about typed scripts. I'm talking about typed arrays that are in JavaScript. And this kind of makes sense when I think about it. An array in JavaScript is like you have an arbitrary length object in memory, and the operating system needs to say, well, I don't know what you're going to store in it, so I'm just going to keep kind of adding elements in memory. It can be a, a Boolean. It can be a number. It can be an image. It can be a DOM node. It's just like a mess of data held in memory, so it's not very fast to move around. Whereas a typed array, its length cannot change, so you have to pre-allocate the amount of memory you need. And the actual elements inside of that array are only ever going to be either a, a uin8 or a, a float32 uh, or a float64. So it's always exactly the same length. So the operating system is really quick to kind of work through it. So it made it really fast. You don't have to read any of the code. If anyone's trying to parse that in their head, don't worry about it. So now I can make visual bars from audio because I'm processing it through that uh, handler. OK, so um, this one's one for your eyes and ears. So those bars are generated based on the sound that it can hear. And then I've just added the binary just for effect. So you can see what, like, the blue bar is a 1. It doesn't look exactly like the spectrum, but it's pretty close, I think. Like, close enough that I was happy enough with it. So we've now got the bars for a website. OK, so I've got the audio and the bars. But there are loads of really good dead format images on the web. So you've got, you've got um, uh, all of these old formats for the spectrum, for the, the imagery that was on the internet. I want to be able to render those. I want to bring those back to life. Okay, And this is what um, a, an, an image, a full image on the spectrum would look like. And it's got this really, I think, beautiful kind of loading effect. It loads in, in three parts, in black and white, and then the color comes in. And the reason it loads like that is that the actual file is literally broken into th uh, four parts. So the first th th uh, three quarters is the binary for the pixel. So if it's a 1, the pixel is on. If it's a 0, the pixel is off. And like, I understand graphics when it's like that. That's, that's easy to follow, or it's easy to follow for me, like on, off. And then the last section is the attribute data. And the attribute data contains things like color um, and brightness and a few other bits. In fact, 
this is how it breaks down. So a single byte, so an 8-bit uh, byte, we've got the ink in the first three uh, bits. We've got the paper, which is kind of the, the, the binary zeros, what color we're going to use for the binary zero. We've got a bright flag, and we have the blink flag long before the blink element in HTML. Look at that, with like Spectrum 1980 preceding HTML, leading the way. OK, so what's really nice about this for me is I get to take these, um, these, these raw files, these, um, uh, take all the bytes from these old screen formats, and run it into JavaScript. So I can get all the bytes out of it using uh, like a, the fetch API and request as a buffer array. And um, I end up with a file that is uh, 6,916 bits. Yeah, sounds about right. Yeah, you still awake? Yeah, cool, OK. There's someone in the other room nodding, by the way. They know, they're listening. Um, and anyway, you take this file, and if you want to jump to any section, you do a, a, a shift 11 on uh, the number, which will do a binary shift, and it will tell you what section it belongs in, so either the first or the uh, second, third, or the attribute data. And what's good about this is that uh, a, a, um, a bitwise shift is really, really fast. Um, but what's even better about this, it makes me look like a elite hacker. Yeah. So here's some code that renders old screen formats. Um, we, we're using the, the lesser used uh, uh, int 8 clamped array, which gives me points for like that rare uh, typed array. We've got uh, shifting going on. We've got bitwise comparisons. Um, we've got modulus in the code, which is, uh, which is pretty cool. I've even got an await. So basically, that's an 11 on the, the hacker score. I am um, I'm leading the way in, in like uncommented code and uh, feeling pretty cool about myself. Once this code runs, I can go off to the World of Spectrum website and basically grab all of these terrible, outdated formats and render them in the browser. Look at this. Like, look at the color. There's a lot of Batman for some reason. Batman the movie, Batman, Batman, uh, flashing going on. Uh, we've got Jetpack. Does anyone recognize any of these games? One person? Ah, Manic Miner? Look at that. Animated. Animation long before animated GIFs. How good is that? I know, you're excited. Robocop. Robocop looks pretty mean. There's a lot of, like, killing games. Yeah, a lot of bullets and stuff. He looks pretty happy, or she looks pretty happy. Anyway, cool. So now I, I can resurrect old crap image formats. Sweet. But there is a lot of pictures of dogs and cats on the internet. We need to fix that, too. OK. We don't want all these beautiful for image formats like WebP and all that nonsense. We want terrible, like 256 by 192, 15 color, shitty image format. So we need to go and get all of those really beautiful images and make them crap. OK, now uh, the spectrum has this, uh, the image um, structure has this thing called uh, attribute clash, where because you can only have um, two colors in a single 8 by 8 block, you end up with things like uh, this, where uh, this the color here is kind of a it bleeds into uh, the other eight by eight blocks, and you can see when you zoom in that you can only have uh, an ink and a paper, so two colors inside of the eight by eight block, and that's the key part to replicating this properly, making sure that you get that clash. Okay, so using web APIs, I know that I can take an image, a regular like dog picture and put it into a canvas. That part, relatively to everything else, is easy. Now the next part is to take the 15 colors of a spectrum and apply the Atkinson's dither algorithm, which is also easy if you can copy and paste as well as I can. And then the next part is replicating the uh, attribute clash, which was a little bit um, uh, a little bit hairy for me, because I, most of the time I don't really know what I'm doing. I'm just changing values and hitting refresh a lot. Um, so I wasn't quite sure how I was going to do this. But it, it, it did work in the end. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't be sad here talking about it. Um, so this is what it looks like. We end up with this, um, th this beautiful guy. Um, and we've loaded it into a canvas, and we've just kind of stretched it over. So you can see, when I move my mouse around, uh, an 8 by 8 block, you can see all the colors in there. So um, the next thing we need to do is apply the um, dither algorithm. And it gets us pretty close to what looks like a spectrum image. The problem is, 
Um, there's way too many colors in an 8x8 block. You can see here where I've zoomed in, um, we've got uh, black, gray, uh, white, and red. And if I actually, that gray is white, and where it's white, it's bright white. Um, and you've got areas like this where you actually have gray and white, but white, the, that's just white. You can't have bright white and white. The, and it's, I'll show you in a second if you're following that. So, right, the next part of this is to um, go through and find the, you can see that in the corner? Yeah, uh, go, find, go through that 8 by 8 block and find the two most popular colors. Um, but they can't be the same, like, the same color. So where I show you the, the gray and the white, that's just one color. So we end up with just one white. Um, then when we found the two most popular colors, we basically get rid of the other ones and um, bleed the popular colors into the ones we got rid of. And we end up with a mask that looks like this, which I like to call the nightmare mask. Um, but you can see in my square, I now only have black and white, so I've only got the, the binary 0 and 1. And then when I fill the color back in again, I've got uh, a spectrum-compatible image. I've taken a decent JPEG, or you know, arguably decent JPEG, um, and made it into uh, a compatible image where there's only um, ink and paper and only two colors in each block. So. That works, that's good. Get my mouse back. The next part is like, OK, so I can make the sound. I can do the bars. I can replicate all the old images, and I can also oldify all the images. How about I wire all those things up? How about I take something like my phone, take a photo, turn that photo into uh, data, into a compatible image format, then turn it into audio, then read all that audio in the browser and render it all again. Oh, yeah, this should be easy. All right, I've got all the mov moving parts, just have to put them together. Um, now, the first thing before I um, show you this is that uh, getting the audio required uh, doing get user media. And um, I'm just going to start this again. And the first time I plugged in my phone, and play the audio into my machine, this is what happened. So I'm just going to put the sound up a little bit. No. No, oh, no, sorry. There you go. And here it's kind of a bit crunchy. This is a visualization of the sound wave. And what happens is it starts off really good. And it gets worse and worse and worse. And it, doesn't, it gets kind of worse to my ear. Um, but also, the machine hears less and less of it. So when I ran it the first time, it just wouldn't work. And the reason for this is when you're there with your phone, and you're walking around and talking to someone on your phone, which we all do. We don't use it as a, a Twitter, expensive Twitter machine. Um, there's background sounds going on. And the microphone and the chips inside the phones and the chips inside the machines on the microphones are really good at removing background noise. And I built a project that just generates noise. So the machine's like, you don't want to hear that. I'll get rid of it for you. So the default, default kind of position for a browser is, we're going to get rid of that bad noise for you. So it just nuked it. And eventually, that whole audio profile just gets flat. The machine stops being able to hear anything I'm sending it, yet it's kind of like killing my ears. Um, Luckily, though, I managed to get around the problem of uh, making good sound, and we can hear it again. So here, I've used a flag that's very like, deeply tucked inside the specifications, where I do echo cancellation equals false. And you can see that the, the audio profile is like completely flat and stable, and my machine was able to hear everything again. Cool. So I reckon I'm ready to load it into the machine. Now, how awake are you? <laughs> OK, so I wrote my own like mini Spectrum emulator, which is in here. This is a canvas. It's running some JavaScript. And I can connect my phone, or try to connect my phone, to this and uh, play it. Or I can get a real 1982 ZX Spectrum 
and plug my phone into that and try and get uh, technology that's like over 20 years old to render an image from my phone. Which one should I do? The old shitty one? Yeah, not the new coat? OK. So can we switch the audio and the, the s picture? Oh, I'm going to. So this is how you reset a spectrum. You pull the power out the back, and you put it back in again. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I can hear you going loud. Maybe <laughs> wait until it's coming. OK, so on my phone, um, I've got uh, 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 just a browser, as you all do. Um, and um, uh, inside the browser, I've got a file picker. So I'm going to tap the file picker and take a photo. And then I'm going to plug the audio into the, um, the microphone jack of the, um, the Spectrum. And the Spectrum is going to load, hopefully, the picture. OK? But I need a cable first. I've got a cable down here somewhere. All right, there's a lot of cables going on here. OK, so, and sometimes it doesn't work because I replicated some of the 1982's bugs. OK? And it goes really bad when it doesn't work. So I'm going to start off by taking a picture. Um, I'll take a picture of you all. All right? You ready? You smiling? You smiling at the back? Yeah, oh, oh, yeah, go for it. Yep. Ready? One, two. There you go. I'm taking a picture. All right. It's so my picture. Uh, I'm going to plug my phone in here to an audio jack with like multiple adapters because a fucking USB 3.0 is not compatible with old uh, technology. Um, and we need to tell the spectrum that something's going to happen. So I'm going to press load. And I'm going to try and find empty quotes. Where the there you go. All right. Obviously, load empty quotes. OK, so Spectrum is waiting for some sound. I don't know how loud this is going to be, so you're on point, right? OK, so I'm going to hit the, the accept picture. It's going to start playing sound. Oh, that's not going to work. Nope, not loud enough on my side, sorry. Right, I'm going to do that again. When I can see that no bars are coming in, that's really off to the side, isn't it? Um, when I can see there's no bars happening, I'm going to have to just start again. So just bear with me. It's a really good way of eating into my time. All right. All right. All right. Ready? Load. Shift. Go. All right. Ready? Go. Oh, it's good. It's good. OK, cool. So that tells me that I something's coming. That's good as well. That's fine. Don't worry. All right, bytes. So it sees the file that I'm trying to send. I'm sending it. All right, this is good. So spare a thought for me when I was a child, listening to this shit and waiting to play a game. Like children, if you have kids, they're impatient, right? You think this is just the screen. No data, no actual playable data. Looks pretty good so far, right? A totally legible. Just about make out some hair, maybe. All right, so this is the, the three parts, and then the color's going to come in next. You ready? This is how I wait for my games to load. Like, just like, come on, please load, please load, please load. Color. Yeah! That worked. Oh, I need to come up my screen. Don't switch over just yet. Um, OK, yeah, if, can you switch me back? <laughs> All right. So I have quite literally spent 18 months on this project. And it's not even a project. It's just like, wouldn't it be fun to destroy my eardrums on this stuff? Um, I thought I'd like include some of the, the this is how it started, actually. Um, I thought it'd be cool that I could just, I can get data out of a file, and I put it in JSBin, and I parse the file, and I was like, oh, that was easy. That took me like two minutes. So there's all the binary. I'm sure it won't take me 18 months to uh, actually get working. Um, and I've got all these kind of like stages of this project where I tried it in React first, and you see my CPU? <laughs> like more CPU power than I had CPUs. So that's, that was not good. 
Um, this is a flame chart of me trying to uh, an early version of it going just completely bananas. Um, I found this in my code. This is the bit. This is a bit of code that works out when the sample goes from positive to negative. That that's the whole function. Like there's no comment there. I looked at it a year later. I was like, what is that supposed to do? <laughs> there's just like there's brackets and uh, to comment your code is that. Um, I learned all about little endians and big endian endians. Um, which I have no idea about because I'm a JavaScript programmer and the idea of like bits make no sense to me. Um, so I canvassed Twitter, I was like, what does that 1300 mean? And they're like, oh, it means 13, obviously. Um, and then I got to a point where I could read that. I could look at it and be like, oh, I can see that you know, that's where the header is and that's where the, the bytes are. And I think I can. So you see where it was all like 20, 20, 20, 20? Just after that is the image data. So I've got a. a, a another crap skill. Um, this was me trying to render the images early on. That's what I would get. I would take those old spectrum images, and they look like that. Um, and then it got slightly better. Um, you, can, you can see where I was replicating the spectrum bugs, um, where the colors just completely corrupted. Um, this was another one where the, everything was shifted. And basically, if you get the maths a little bit wrong, and you, you kind of start reading from the wrong place, it kind of all works anyway. It's a little bit resilient when it's just like 1 and 0 are bits. Uh, this was uh, yeah. This is early versions of me trying to replicate the uh, the, the spectrum uh, graphics. Uh, it gets slightly better, but um, this is why I don't sleep well. Um, and then eventually I, I do get there, but I'm a bit kind of blown out. Um, the reason I did this was to give myself a little bit of distraction from reality and the work that I do. The big uh, I got to learn a ton of stuff through resources that. Just anonymous people just put out on the web, and they were just like, I want to share how this thing works. I'm going to put it on the internet. I'm not going to put a paywall around it. I just want to share my knowledge. And that's like, you know, that's you and me and everyone else working on the web. We're just sharing all this knowledge, and I love that. Um, and this machine, I mean, as much as I hate computers, is my only creative outlet. I get to be, like, express my creativity using code and uh, making these things. And it, as, as long as the project took me to get to the point where I was happy with it, every time it loads, I'm like, that looks awful, but I'm really proud of myself. So um, I do it because I enjoy it. And I think that you have to find stuff that you, you enjoy doing. So thanks for listening.